The focus of this presentation will be on the first of the three circles in our problem-solving framework, that is, problem identification. The first issue is, why start with a problem? Why not just collect as much data as we can and try to see what statistical connections we can make between the phenomenon we're observing? The reason that you want to start with a problem has to do with getting things done in the real world. It's not enough for you to believe that something is a problem. If people in the field do not think something is an important problem, there will be no constituency for solving the problem and therefore no stakeholders on whom you can rely. Let's take an example. In the 1990s, the World Bank observed that poor countries were being held back by weak governments and corruption. And they theorized that these conditions were the byproduct of faulty incentives in local bureaucracies. They consequently pushed developing countries to engage in what was called comprehensive civil service reform, which involved changing pay and promotion incentives. It turned out, however, that virtually no one in the developing countries themselves thought they needed comprehensive civil service reform. Poor country governments accepted funds from the World Bank and pretended to reform their civil services, but at the end, nothing changed. Indeed, many developing countries had hired people into the civil service not to actually deliver services, but for patronage reasons. So politicians had little incentive to really change things. On the other hand, if you choose a problem that people in the field believe is a problem, then you will have the beginnings of a stakeholder coalition that will be necessary to actually implement a solution to the problem. No problem can be solved without building a coalition. So identifying real problems that important groups of people want to solve is an important point of departure. The first step in problem identification is to explore the problem by gathering as much information as possible about it. This involves diving into local context. There is no such thing as a generic problem that appears in an identical form across different societies. Not just every country, but every locality within every country has its own history, geography, politics, actors, and culture about which it is important to understand as much as possible. The second step is to undertake, if possible, a preliminary consultation with stakeholders. We'll return to stakeholder strategy in the implementation phase. But for now, we want to make sure that we understand the points of view of important actors who either want the problem solved or who don't think it's a problem at all. In other words, both supporters and potential opponents. The third step is to do a complete causal map. Starting with the problem, we need to work backwards through a tree of causes that lead to it. This involves repeatedly asking the question, why? The Indian city of Hyderabad is home to a vibrant high-tech sector, but it cannot supply more than half of its residents with clean drinking water. Some of that water is stolen, and a lot of it leaks out from an aging infrastructure of pipes. So you need to ask, if water is being stolen, who's stealing it? And why are they getting away with it? If pipes are leaking, why is it not possible to repair them? The causal map at this point will consist of causes that can potentially be affected by changes in policies, but it will also include causes like global warming or Hyderabad's physical location, which we're not likely to do very much about, at least in the short run. The final step in this phase of the analysis is to define the scope of the problem. One of the big challenges in policy reform is doing things that will make a real difference in people's lives but that are also realistically doable. An example of an unrealistic problem is something like, how can we eliminate corruption in Ukraine? Or how do we end child poverty in India? On the other hand, a problem like, how do we reduce the level of corruption in the defense procurement system of Ukraine might be something that could be accomplished. Policies enacted in, a single, in single cities or even single neighborhoods are usually much more doable than those that affect entire nations, even though their scope is obviously small. But starting small, as we will see, can be seen as a way to prototype, and if things work well, they can be scaled up later. 
At the end of this step, then, you will have completed the problem definition phase of analysis. You should have chosen a problem, explored its various dimensions, and come to understand the local context, consulted, if possible, stakeholders, done a complete causal map, and finally focused the scope to something that is doable yet important. Having identified the problem, we can now move to the next phase of analysis, which is solution development.